Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this special live uh, Facebook Live event um, with Jimmer Fredette. My name is Gordon Treadway. I'm the co-founder of this Facebook page, The Road to Hope and Peace, which is a um, Facebook page sponsored by the Utah Orem Mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, we're excited and grateful that you're all here with us tonight for this um, special event. Um, it's, uh, it's especially a treat to have Jimmer with us tonight. He was kind enough to offer to share his time and his testimony of, uh, of spiritual things with all of us tonight. Let me just tell you just a little bit about Jimmer Fredette, and then we'll turn the time over to, to him. Jimmer, to my shock, is 31 years old, and I don't know how that happened, and he'll have to explain that too, but Jimmer Fredette, 31 years old, born and raised in upstate New York, Glens Falls, New York, which uh, I'm partial to upstate New York. It's produced a lot of my heroes and friends through the years mm -hmm. and uh, a long time ago as well. For sure. Uh, at, um, uh, he played college basketball at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, where he was a two-time NCAA All-American, um, including in 2011, his senior year, he was the uh, NCAA Player of the Year and later was picked in the first round of the NBA uh, by the Sacramento Kings. Um, it's a long story, but I was a season ticket holder when that happened in Sacramento, California. So I got a chance to to watch Jimmer up close, both in college and uh, in the NBA. He played in the NBA for five years and uh, and since the uh, two, 2016 season has been playing professionally in uh, international basketball and is, uh, has, is kind of, I like to say he's the, he won't say this, but he's kind of the Michael Jordan of, uh, of China right now. So uh, he's got his own, uh, he's got his own basketball shoes as well. So, um, but I think uh, Jimmer will talk about it tonight, but more important to him than all of his success on the basketball court has been his success um, both spiritually and also as a family man. He's been married to his wife, Whitney, for I think five years now, Jimmer, am I close? Close, eight, crazy. Eight yeah. years, that, yeah. that's how you became 31, I guess. Exactly, very, <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> Married to his, his wife, Whitney, for uh, eight years, and they have two children, his daughter, Wesley, and his son, Taft, which uh, for those who may be wondering for the next uh, trivia question, Jimmer's middle name is Taft, so... Right. Uh, so that's kind of fun, but uh, we're grateful for his example as a good Christian and as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And again, Jimmer, thank you so much for being willing to take a little bit of time tonight from your home in Denver, Colorado, to share a few thoughts with us. So I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, President Treadway, or Treadway, for letting me be able to do this. This is an awesome page that you guys have started, and uh, you know I'm excited to be a part of it, and hopefully be able to, to speak to everyone out there. I hope there's a, you know, I know there's a lot of missionaries, um, some investigators. I know there's some uh, some youth and, and people in different wards out in Orem and uh, in different areas as well. So I'm very excited to be able to speak with you guys and and uh, be a part of this night with you. And, uh, you know, President Tre Treadway came to me a few weeks ago and just asked me if I wanted to speak. And, um, you know, I thought it was a great opportunity to be able to do that. I love being able to to talk in firesides and devotionals and different things to be able to spread my knowledge. I mean, I don't have as much knowledge as a lot of people do, but I have some life experience being able to uh, have lived all over the world and have uh, experienced the church all over the world and been able to do good things uh, for people and charity work all over the world, which has been really a fun thing for me. So, uh, you know, he asked me to, to speak about why do I believe in the, rest the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? And uh, it's a great, great topic. Um, but like I mentioned, I've done a lot of uh, firesides and devotionals before, but I want to take you back to the first time that I was at BYU, the first time that I did a devotional or a fireside at BYU. And uh, my friends and basketball teammates, Chris Collinsworth and uh, Nick Martineau, I was rooming with them in the dorms. They were both from Utah. You know, they both were, you know, familiar with the type of fireside that you know, they give in Utah. Now I'm from, as brother Treadway said, upstate New York, small town called Glens Falls. It's 14,000 people. And I was the only member in my high school. And, you know, there were people coming from 
you know, a couple hours to get to church, you know, if they wanted to. There just wasn't many meeting houses in the area. So when I heard of a fireside, when we went to firesides, there was literally like 15 people and it would meet at a house and it would be fun. You know what I mean? We'd have, we'd have some, some brownies and we'd have, you know, some drink and, and, and just kind of hang out and, and have a speaker, but it was like 15 people. So Chris and Nick, they came to me and they're like, Hey, would you like to be a part of our fireside? You know, that would be great to be able to tell your story and be able to talk about, um, you know, yourself and where you came from and why you were out to BYU and kind of your story. And I was like, perfect. Sure. Yeah. I'd love to talk about myself. That's not a problem. I have a great, I'll have a great time doing that. So I decided, yeah, let's do it. So, you know, we were talking that night and I just mentioned to him, I was like, all right, so where's it going to be? How many people you think are going to be there? That type of thing. And, and Nick promptly said, there's going to be like probably 300 people there. Or so, and I just like looked at him and like my jaw dropped. It's like, 300 people what do you mean like I thought it was a fireside and they're gonna be like 30 20 30 people there he's like no 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 this is a Utah fireside you know everyone from the area comes and uh you know all the members come all the youth and we're going to talk there's going to be like 300 people and I had never spoken in front of that many people before <laughs> so I was just like I was like oh no I walked away and I was like trying to get, get my breath a little bit and I was like oh no I, what did I get myself into so I come back to Nick and I was like okay <laughs> got myself, I'm going to have to do it at some point. So I decided, all right, I'm going to ask you one more time. How many people are going to be there? He's like, there's probably going to be like three to 500 people. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You just went from three to 500, like in a second. And I was going to walk away again and like, get, um, you know, collect myself again. But I figured if I left and came back, I was going to move to five to 700. So I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to keep with the three to 500. I went to the fireside, overcame my fear was able to speak to, to everyone and, uh, you know, had a great time and have been able to do very, very uh, many of many more since then. And I've hopefully gotten a little bit better in front of crowds and been able to do a lot more uh, of these. It's been a lot of fun to be able to do it. So I overcame my fear there, but, you know, I was definitely, uh, you know, a little bit flabbergasted with how many people were going to be there. But I know there's a lot of people listening tonight, but, you know, firesides and devotionals, obviously, in the last couple of months have changed. And I've been able to do several on Zoom um, with missionaries all over the world, in Rome, Italy, and, and in, uh, in Germany, um, in, all, in Hawaii, and all different parts of the world, which has been an awesome experience for me. So there it is, and I'm glad to be here with you guys tonight. So, um, you know, I'll just talk a little bit about kind of my story tonight and how I, became, how I became a member and, you know, why I believe it's important to me and the struggles that I've had throughout this process. So, like I said, I grew up in a family um, uh, of, of five. Um, my mom, my dad, my sister, and my brother, uh, Lindsay and TJ. And, um, you know, my mom actually wasn't a member of the church, and she still isn't today. Uh, my dad is the member of the church, um, and he converted when he was 18 with his brother and his sister. And uh, he's been an amazing, uh, you know, example to me, as well as my mother has been. But my dad has been an amazing example to me about how to be a great member of the church. And, you know, even though my mom didn't necessarily go to church all the time, she used to come sometimes to sacrament meeting, she would always allow me to go to church. You know, she didn't have any problems with that. She loved what the church taught. She wanted me to go to church. So I did. So I used to go to church all the time. Um, but I, when I was younger, um, I was a little, I didn't know any of the kids in primary. I didn't know any of that. So before eight, eight years old, I actually like almost never went to primary. I'd go to sacrament meeting and then my mom would leave and I'd just leave with her and I'd go home. And uh, so I, I did that for a while, and I actually ended up not getting baptized at eight. I got baptized when I was 10 years old, because at 10 years old, I was like, all right, I felt like I needed to, you know, I wanted to be there at church with my dad a little bit more. So I got baptized at 10 years old. Um, my dad baptized me. And then from then I decided I feel like, felt like I needed to try to go for the three hours with my dad. So I started to do that, started to go for three hours, probably not every week, but I tried to do as much as I possibly could. And I knew the, the times that I went to church and that I stayed for the three hours that I just felt really good. You know what I mean? That's how it started when I was younger, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. I just felt good. You know what I mean? I'd come home from, from Sunday and, and watch a football game and hang out. And I just had some type of light about me. I just, you know, I just knew that I had a, a good feeling about it. So that's what kept me coming back, you know, to church and wanting to stay all those, all those three hours. And uh, I started to realize as I got older that I wanted to live what the church uh, believed in. 
Um, you know, the word of wisdom is huge for me. Um, someone who, uh, the church believes that, you know, we don't joke, drink alcohol, we don't smoke, um, you know, go to parties, we don't swear, too many of those things. And for me, that's the way that I wanted to live my life, not only because my parents did, but also because I was an athlete and I wanted to try to keep, you know, my body as healthy as I possibly could. And I wanted to stay out of trouble and make sure that I was focused on my athletic career as well. And the church taught us how to be healthy um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a person and mentally and physically. And, you know, not just for the church, but also for, you know, an athletic standpoint. So, so that's what I started to do. You know, I just, I, I didn't, I didn't ever drink. I didn't ever smoke. Uh, I just try to stay away from parties. You know, I didn't swear or anything like that. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to, to be healthy. And I knew that I had a sense of peace and a sense of joy when I let my heavenly father in. And I felt that spirit when I went to church. So as I grew up through, through high school, um, you know, like I said, I was the only member in the church. Um, and people knew that I was the only member in the church. They knew that I was the, the Mormon kid. And, uh, you know, they, they always, always invited me to parties and my friends, you know, wanted me to, to go with them. And one of the things that they always tried to get me to, they always tried to get me to swear. They, they just wanted me to say one swear word for my whole life. That's all they wanted. And they were like, you know, we would sit at the lunch table and they put down like $5 and we'd be like, Jimmer, swear one time and you get that $5. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. They're like, okay. $20. I'm like, no, not doing it. And they're like, all right, $1 million. I'm like, let me see the money first and then we'll talk. <laughs> but uh, no, I never, they always used to play games like that with me. And they saw that I just wasn't going to do it. And uh, you know, cause I, I had it in my mind before going into, I'm just not going to swear. I'm not going to go to parties. If I ever was at a friend's house and all of a sudden someone brought alcohol in, you know, and they asked me if I wanted to drink most of the times my friends would be like, Oh no, 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 no. He doesn't drink, you know, keep that away from him. They would, they would say that because they already knew what my answer was going to be. So they started protecting me and everything, which is an awesome thing. That means that I had really good friends. And those are the type of people, even if they're not members of the church, you, those are the type of people that you want to surround yourself with people that are good, positive influences in your life that, that like you for you, you know, because I've had, you know, people that do think that I, I'm weird, you know, think that I'm different teammates that thought that I was different because I didn't want to do all of those things. I, I tried to stay away from that and that's okay. That's going to happen, but it's okay to be different. It's okay to, to have a different point of view and uh, you know, you just make sure that you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing and try to love everyone as, as much as you possibly can. Um, so I continued to go to church and, and I got a little bit stronger in my testimony as I kept going through high school, but eventually, you know, I, it led me to BYU and, you know, I was, deciding whether I wanted to go to two different schools. I wasn't heavily recruited out of high school. It was either Siena College, which was like 40 minutes away from my hometown, which was a really good basketball school at the time, or it was BYU, which was obviously a much bigger school, a little bit better basketball school, but it was you know 2,000 miles away from my family, and I had never been anywhere close to that. But I decided I needed to go to BYU, so I did. I packed up my bags. I went to BYU, and obviously... Once I got there, I learned a, a ton about the church. I learned a ton about the gospel from the friends that I had there. They were just really, really good people. Um, you know, I met so many good members of the church, uh, so many good leaders that helped me out through that time. And, uh, you know, I honestly, when I got there, I was like, man, I mean, these kids are like, they're amazing. They're like perfect. You know, and that's what I felt when I got there. I was like, I'm a terrible kid. I feel like compared to some of these guys. And, uh, but that, that was good. It was, it was made me want to become better. It made me want to be, help more people and everything. And, um, you know, so that's, it, I did. And, and um, I learned, you know, obviously I wasn't there with my family. I wasn't there with my dad and he had been such a good influence on me um, and had helped me get to church and helped me get to seminary and all these things. When you're out in college, you know, it's on you, you know, it's on you to do these things by yourself. Um, it was on me to get up and go to church um, and get there early so I could pass the sacrament. It was on me to help others and be kind to others or, you know, go to a, a, an activity and event. And uh, I, I'll be honest, I wasn't 100% at all of these things, but uh, I tried the best that I possibly could. And I kept getting better and better and better. And uh, as, I, as I attended church, you know, things kept getting better for me off the floor. And, uh, you know, I started to, to play really well. I started to have a, a great career at BYU. We started to do really well. Um, you know, we, my senior year, we were ranked top five in the country. 
Um, you know, we were able to make it to the Sweet 16. I had a lot of national notoriety. You know, things were going really, really well. And uh, but as much as you know how good I felt on the court, like there was nothing better than you know, it felt like there was nothing better at beating San Diego State you know, on our court, at our home. I felt like I was on top of the world. People were just yelling down and they rushed the court and surrounded me and all these things. And, but it still didn't have the same type of feeling that I have when I go to church and I, when I hear someone speak that really touches you and really when you feel that spirit, um, it's a different feeling. It's a feeling of peace and it's a feeling of joy. And, you know, I always felt that and, and I would compare it to how I felt on the basketball court. And, you know, there's so many things that are going on when you're in college. Um, there's a lot of stress that could, that could happen, you know, especially when you're an athlete. There's school, you know, there's basketball, there's practice, there's girls, there's all these different things that are going on. And you have to learn how to compartmentalize these things because there's a lot of stress that goes with it. But I found that if I could really, really um, just hone into, you know, my Heavenly Father hone into uh, going to church and feeling these feelings, I, I felt better about everything. I was able to kind of just have a peace of mind being like, okay, you know, these things are important, but what's really important? You know, what's really important is about being a good person, about helping others, about trying to be a good example for the kids that are watching me play basketball. There, there's always people watching me and I, I understood that. So I tried to be the best example I could possibly be. And, and that's what really made me feel good. And that's what helped me be, um, you know, helped me through these tough times. So, you know, as I said, at BYU, obviously an amazing season, had a lot of fun. And then I, I was able to have such a good season. I was going to be drafted into the NBA. And uh, that was my ultimate goal. Like when I was six years old, I was like, I'm going to make it into the NBA. And I had no other plan. I didn't have a plan B. So I'm glad that plan A worked. Because uh, I wasn't able, I, was, I didn't know what I was going to do after that, but I just had it in my mind. I was going to be a basketball player. And uh, fortunately, I was able to get drafted number 10th in the NBA draft in the lottery. I uh, went to the Sacramento Kings. Um, and at that point, you know, I was, I was pretty much a celebrity. I mean, um, I had millions of fans all over the world. Um, you know, people knew who I was wherever I went. People were asking for pictures and autographs. And I just felt like I was on top of the world. And uh, I started off. Um, with the season and started playing pretty well, actually, um, the first two weeks of the season, coming off the bench, having 20 minutes, 25 minutes a game, I was averaging about 10 points a game, things were going pretty well, and I was still doing good. And then all of a sudden, my coach got fired, the coach that drafted me, his name was Paul Westfall. And he drafted me, he believed in me, and he got fired, and he was gone two weeks in. And all of a sudden, things started to change. Um, you know, my coach that came in, uh, right after him was an interim head coach. He was coming into a really difficult situation. We had some, some teammates and guys on the team that were difficult to deal with. And, uh, you know, we were, the owners were trying to sell the team. The GM was about to be fired. So he had no say in anything. We just didn't have a great structure. And all of a sudden, you know, I didn't, I stopped playing, you know, there would be games where I'd play nothing, no minutes at all. And then there'd be games where I'd play 20 minutes and it would fluctuate. And that really played with my head at that time. Yeah, because I had never been through a situation like that. I'd never been through a situation where I was on top of the world and all of a sudden I wasn't playing and people were booing me or people were, you know, wondering why I wasn't playing or why I wasn't doing good. And, you know, people in the media, people just around town, you know, I was hearing all of these different things. And honestly, at that point, I got to a pretty low point in my life. Um, you know, I felt almost a little bit depressed at that point and I just wasn't myself. And along top of this, you know, I was out in Sacramento by myself and at BYU, I had met um, my wife today, Whitney, who was one year younger than me. And uh, so she was still out at BYU. And uh, so I wasn't seeing, we were engaged at the time. Um, we were waiting, we were uh, planning to be married after the season. Um, so I wasn't seeing her. I was out there by myself. My family would come and kind of hang out with me as much as I, poss as I possibly could. And they could just tell that I just wasn't my, myself. I was just down and it was, it was, it was difficult on me. So I had talked to my family about it. I talked to Whitney about it. I talked to pretty much every about everyone about it. You know, I tried to pray about it as much as I could. And I just felt like I needed to speak to someone else, but I didn't know who to speak to. Um, so it was a December, it was in December. I remember, um, you know, this very vividly. I came home for, or I, I got done with practice and I went into the locker room and uh, I had a message on my cell phone at the time. 
and I looked at the message and it was a call and I listened to the message and it was a, it was a call from um, M. Russell Ballard. And it was, uh, it was amazing because I had spoken to, to Elder Ballard before going into the NBA. He wanted to check in on me, see how I was doing, making sure that, you know, if I ever need anything, let me know, let him know, um, you know, but it, I just didn't feel like it was right for me to just call, you know, an apostle to talk with him at the time. And, and, but he ended up calling me on this day in December. And I was like, oh my goodness, I got to get in my car. I got to call him back. So I rushed off. I didn't even shower. Like I just grabbed my stuff and took off, went into the car and, uh, you know, I called him back and he was just like, Hey, Jimmer, how are you doing? How are things going? And, and honestly, I don't think he knew exactly what was coming when he asked me that question, you know, cause I just laid it all out there for him. I was like, you know, honestly, things are not going well. You know, they're not going well. I don't feel well. Um, I'm just down, you know, I feel dark, um, things aren't, things are, you know, just not going in my favor, and I honestly don't know what to do about it, and he's like, you know, that happens in, in every single person's life, um, it doesn't just happen in basketball players' lives, it, ha lives. it happens in every profession that you're going to get into in your life, things aren't going to go exactly the way that they are planned, um, you know, but you have to continue to work, and you have to continue to have faith, and know that Heavenly Father has a plan for us, and he has, um, a place for us in this, in this world. And he has a place for us to, to move forward to. And, you know, then he, then he challenged me to start reading the book of Mormon. He, he asked me to, to read the book of Mormon from start to finish by the time the season ended. And, um, I had never read the book of Mormon fully. I had read many parts of the book of Mormon. I had read the, uh, the book of Mormon on many occasions, but I hadn't read it from front to cover. And he challenged me to do that. And I did. Every single day, I started reading the Book of Mormon from December, and the season ends in April. So I had to uh, I had to to finish it at that point, and I started reading my scriptures every single day, sometimes twice a day, and things started to get better for me. And it wasn't that basketball started to get better for me because that pretty much stayed the same. At that point, um, you know, I still wasn't playing a ton. I was very inconsistent. Things, you know, necess weren't necessarily going in my favor, but I was way happier. I started to, to think about things in a different aspect of my life. Um, I started thinking about the important things of life again. I started to think about, hey, you know, what, what do I really need to do here? How can I go out and serve someone today? How can I come into the locker room with a positive attitude? And how can I go in there and work hard every single day, knowing that my Heavenly Father has a plan for me, whatever that is. And I just had to have faith. And being able to read those scriptures all of a sudden just lifted me up. And I am so grateful for him to be able to have have the, the, you know, wherewithal and have the spirit lead him to speak with me that day. And uh, that's how I gained a testimony of this church, on, like on my own. Like at that point, I knew that the church was true. I knew that the prophets and apostles, that they had, a, they were inspired by God to be able to do uh, work on this earth. And they were, they were here to help others um, because he helped me so much during that day. So I started you know, I started reading my scriptures, you know, and trying to do it as meaningfully as I possibly could, you know, trying to write things down, trying to really study the scriptures to understand them. And, uh, you know, I've been extremely best blessed because of it. Um, as we talked about, my, my NBA career was kind of up and down. I had some really great moments in the NBA, and then I had some not so great moments in the NBA. You know, there was a lot of different things that, you know, were, were, have gone into that, but I continued to read my scriptures each and every single day. And that's really helped me out going forward into my international career. So now I moved from MBA, you know, I, I, I didn't have as much MBA interest and I had to decide what I was going to do after that. So I decided that I was going to move to China and play basketball in China. And at first that was really scary to me. You know, I had never been out of the country. You know, uh, my wife at the time was, uh, was pregnant and we knew that and she knew we knew that she wasn't going to be able to fly over to China very often because of the fact that it was too far of a flight being pregnant at that time. Um, so I had a, a tough decision to make, but I felt like it was the right thing for my career and I had prayed about it so many times and it just hit me in the middle and I, I needed to go to China. So I decided to do that. And uh, when I got over there, um, you know, things were, were really good. You know, I mean, obviously my wife wasn't there and that was very difficult. Um, so off the floor was tough, but on the floor, it went amazing. I couldn't have asked for anything better. I was able to win the MVP. Um, you know, I got sh a shoe deal as brother, um, Treadway said, and, 
and you know I was kind of getting becoming really famous over there and it was it just took me in a different path of my career that I never could have expected but one of the things that I, I feel like it was best for is that people knew that I was a member of the church over there and um, you know the when you're in China, you know, you can't, there, there is a, there is a couple of branches in Shanghai that I was actually able to attend. Um, but all over China, they don't really know about the gospel. Um, we don't have missionaries over there teaching about the gospel. Um, we don't have, you know, a, a whole lot of church and meeting buildings everywhere. We're meeting in different rooms and everything. So people don't really know about the gospel over there. Um, but they knew that I was a member. So they started becoming more aware of it. So people would ask me questions. My teammates would ask me questions about it, and in particular, my, one of my uh, one of my uh, great uh, uh, friends, and he was my translator on the court. Um, he started to pick up on these things, and he started to ask me questions um, just about the church and why. He's like, "Why are you a nice guy?" He's like, "It's so weird, you know. When I look at you, you I, you look so much different than all the other Americans that come over here. You have like a light in your eye, and I don't know what that is." And they, and it was awesome to me to, that they could pick that up, even though that they didn't have necessarily uh, the knowledge of the gospel. They understood that I had the spirit with me and I made it a point to try to have the spirit with me at all times so that, you know, the people around me hopefully could be uplifted. And he, he actually picked up on that. He started asking me about questions and a couple of years later, you know, he was actually going to school in London and he gave me a call on, on WeChat, which is like our FaceTime basically. And uh, he called me on that and he's like, Hey, Jimmer, I just wanted to show you this. And he sends a pic, he, he shows the picture and the missionaries were right next to him. And he was over there and he was getting the discussions by the missionaries over in, in Great Britain. And uh, which was, which was absolutely amazing. Um, he had read up on the church. He wanted to know more about the church. He had taken the discussions and everything. And, uh, you know, hopefully he's on track at some point to become a member. We'll see. But uh, it was amazing to see that Teddy was uh, picking up on that and, that's the type of influence, you know, that you, you can have, you know, in this world. Um, people, you know, people are always watching you. People are looking and seeing, um, they want to see what you're doing, um, especially as members of the church and just people in general. And, you know, I think it's a, a big deal for me and for, for us to, to go out and to be good people and to lead by example. Um, you know, it's, uh, I'll tell you another quick story, um, about, about this, um, so I, when I was at BYU, there was a kid um, that was in Louisville, Kentucky, and he was, uh, he was a really awesome, awesome kid. He was a great basketball player. He loved basketball. He loved the University of, of, of Louisville because he was a, you know, from there, but he started to watch BYU basketball at that time, and uh, he loved our team, and he loved watching me play specifically. Um, he liked that I could shoot the long-range shots. He wanted to be like that. He wanted to do it but he didn't know much about BYU, but he started watching all of our games and he wasn't a member of the church. He just wanted to start out watching all of our games. And uh, so he did and he watched our games and then he would watch the interviews afterward. He would watch me, he would watch my teammates. He would watch how all of us, you know, spoke so highly of our teammates and, you know, that we were, you know, trying to be humble and, and good people we were trying to, you know, congratulate other people. He was just impressed with how we handled stuff off of the court interview wise because we were being, we were such a good team. We had a, a chance to be arrogant if we wanted to. And uh, so, you know, he was impressed by that. So because of it, he started looking up BYU. He's like, what is it about? Brigham Young University. Oh, it's a, it's a, a church of, um, you know, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's who it's affiliated with. It's like, oh, okay. That's amazing. I, I don't want to, I want to learn more about this church. So he actually ended up going to church on a Sunday um, by himself without his parents. He went over there by himself and they got there and he, you know, was able to get, be greeted by several, several different members of the church asking him, Hey, who are you? And, you know, welcome to the church. We'd love to have you. And just started to talk to him. And he, he had never felt that before. He had never had people come up to him and really embrace him and want him to be a part of, you know, this, this church. And he was super impressed by it. And he felt great. He felt something because of it and started to go back more. He started to continue to go to church. Um, he started to go so much that he wanted the missionaries to come to his house and the missionaries um, gave him the discussions and uh, he, he was baptized and became a member of the church and he was 17 years old when this happened and uh, at that point when he turned 18 he decided he wanted to go on a mission so he did he went on a mission and he got called to Littleton Colorado um, and he was in uh, was in church one day 
and he met um, my father-in-law, Rich Wanacott, who lives about 15 minutes from us. He was in church with Rich, and he introduced himself as a new missionary. He said, hey, Rich, I'm, you know, Elder Rafferty, and, uh, you know, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I'm a huge basketball fan. Um, you know, they got speaking, and Rich is probably the biggest BYU basketball fan on the planet, and he's, my, he's a huge sports fan. He's also my father-in-law, so he said, oh, I'm a huge basketball fan. I'm a BYU Cougar. And he's like, no way. You're a BYU Cougar. He's like, I used to love Jimmer Fredette. I used to watch him play all the time. And Rich was like, huh, interesting. You love Jimmer Fredette? He said, well, I know him. <laughs> he said, he's my son-in-law. And Elder Rafferty was like, what? Are you serious? And uh, Rich called me up that night. He said, hey, uh, hey, Jimmer, would it be okay if you came over to, uh, to my house for dinner tonight? You and Whitney, I have a surprise for you. And I said, okay, that would be great. And uh, so I did, we went over there, had a good meal. And all of a sudden the missionaries came to the door and uh, you know, Elder Rafferty was there and he came and he shook my hand and he just started to cry. And because of it, I did, of course, I was, I was like, what do you, what's going on? And he persisted on telling, telling me this story about how you know, he was so touched by myself and by my teammates that he was converted to the church and now he's on a mission trying to spread the gospel because of how he felt because he wanted other people to feel the same way that he felt. And I, it was such an emotional nice night for me, knowing that I was able to help someone, even though I didn't know who they were. And I, didn't, I had never spoken to them. I just had tried to be a good person, try to be a good example, try to live the, the gospel of Jesus Christ because I believed in it. And because of that, people gra gravitate towards that. People gravitate towards you know, the light. Um, especially if they're seeking for it. And there are a lot of people out there that are seeking for it. And uh, so that's, that's one of the many things that I learned. And uh, so I continue to try to be the best person that I can possibly be um, each and every single day. And that's the thing that is, that is most important to me. And I'm not perfect even by a long shot. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I just know that these things are true. And um, so you know, after, you know, I met with Elder Rafi, it was amazing. And I had such a great experience there. And, you know, I was still over in China and everything. And, and I was able to, you know, meet, reach some people in China, which was awesome. And I had an amazing uh, amount of members that were over in China that helped me through that process and helped me meet other people. And, and we tried to do the best that we possibly could over there. And, and the cooks, actually, they're listening online right now. They're in, they're in Pleasant Grove listening. So, Hello, cooks. Good to see you. Hope you guys are well. But uh, they were over in China with me and now they're back. So, um, but, you know, I just, it, I was able to, because of this, start a foundation here in Utah. And, um, you know, this foundation is all about trying to spread kindness. And we have an anti-bully campaign in, in, in these school districts. And, um, you know, this is, for me, what it has been all about. It's been all about trying to give back and trying to help kids become feel included try to help kids feel that kindness and if we can get kids to feel kindness and then spread that kindness then we're all doing our job and um you know that's what christ did when he was on this earth he just tried to to serve others he tried to help others anything that he could possibly do he wanted to spread that kindness and um you know that's that's what we're trying to do with our foundation today and for me it's the best feeling in the world when, if, when we're able to go to a family's house and say that, you know, our foundation has been, has affected their family's lives um, in a positive way. And uh, it's way better than any basket that I've ever made in my entire life. Um, you know, so I would just like to tell a quick story um, about, you know, from the scriptures in the Book of Mormon about Alma the Younger. And uh, this is like one of my favorite stories. Um, you know, Alma the Younger, um, you know, at first was, was someone that, was trying to denounce God and Heavenly Father. Um, you know, he he had, you know, he 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 and his four brothers, uh, the four sons of Messiah, went out, and um, you know, obviously they wanted to to debunk the church. They wanted to do bad acts, and you know, they wanted to perse persecute anyone that believed, you know, in the gospel. And you know, they were they were pretty wicked people at that point. And, um, you know, at, at one point he was so wicked that, you know, our heavenly father decided to, sh to strike him dumb and he couldn't move and he couldn't speak for three days. And he was just laying on the ground. And during those three days, he was able to see a vision 
Um, he was able to see a fed vision of our Heavenly Father sitting on his throne. And he realized at that point that he knew that what he was doing was wrong. And uh, it goes a very powerful, you know, very powerful chapter when he talks about this. And, you know, so when he woke up after that three days, he decided that what he needed to do is he needed to do everything in his power to, to try to bring people to Christ. And um, it was, it's, it's an amazing story because the thing about it is that it doesn't matter where you are in your life. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter what you're doing right now. At any point, at any time, if you choose that you want to become a member of this church and you choose that you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you can do that. And there's a process set up for us, the plan of happiness, so that we can be happy and that we can return to our Heavenly Father again someday. And he has it all laid out for us. And Alma the Younger is a perfect example of that. And um, he's able, he was able to go do great things and convert many people unto Christ and unto the church. And because of it, he was able to, you know, hopefully, I mean, he was able to be exalted. He's able to be with his heavenly father now um, and the highest degree of glory, which is where we all want to be someday. And uh, so I, I just thought that that was such a powerful story in the scriptures that we can all, you know, take advantage of. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, you know, bear my testimony um, to let you know that I know that this church is true. I know that Joseph Smith restored this church in upstate New York, where I'm from. And, um, and uh, that he, um, at, at a young age, at his, as a young boy, was able to receive revelation that none of the churches that he was attending were true and that he needed to go and find and start this church again. And uh, he did. And, um, you know, I believe that the prophets and apostles today, they're all inspired. Um, they know what they're talking about. It's amazing. You know, they're, they're, older, they're older men. You know, some of them are in their 80s and even 90 years old but they know exactly what's going on with our youth today. They know exactly what's going on and they know exactly what there is to come and, uh, and they know how to handle things. And it's, it's uh, amazing to listen to them each and every general conference to hear what they have to say. And, um, you know, I take that very, very seriously. And this last general conference, when they, you know, were able to say that there was a temple going up in Shanghai, that was one of the greatest um, experiences that I've ever had um, as a member of this church playing over in Shanghai, China, and knowing the people there and knowing what they need. Um, and they need the, the gospel more, you know, just as much as all of us. And uh, this is a great start to be able to have that. Um, so I know that this church is true. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful to be a part of it. And, um, you know, I just wanted to say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, uh, Jimmer, that was magnificent. Thank you so much for those stories and for your testimony of, of God and Jesus Christ and the gospel. Um, for those of you watching, and by the way, Jimmer, I don't know if you were nervous, but uh, we have about 1,200 people following this live. Right I love it. It's a little bit more than a Utah fireside. A little bit more. Yeah, it's even more. This is great. It's one of the biggest I've done then. Good. Excellent. Well, you've played in front of a lot bigger crowds, but for sure. <laughs> I know it can be a little bit different, but for people out there who are watching, if you, uh, we've got a few more minutes. Jimmer has been kind enough to offer to stay on a little bit longer and answer some questions. And so if you're, um, if you're watching this now, feel free to just uh, put a comment on the Road to Hope and Peace stream. We have responders watching for your questions and we'll try to answer as many of them as, uh, as we can. Um, Jimmer, I got a, I've got a few questions myself. Sure. Um, I, I really enjoyed your story about how in, in high school, your, your friends, your, your buddies in high school would offer you money to swear. And uh, I you know that, it, as you probably know, that goes, that goes on uh, sometimes late into our ad adulthood. I, uh, I remember one time in the corporate world, someone offered me $500 cash and pulled the cash out if I would have a beer. <laughs> and uh, yeah. it wasn't tempting, but it was flattering. Right, uh, right. <laughs> I'm just wondering as you got into real cash and around people who, um, who may not have at all understood your standards, if that kind of temptation continued in the professional basketball world yeah for sure I mean uh, it got it, it got it to the peak when I made it to the NBA um, you know especially when I was uh, when I was a rookie um, coming from BYU obviously most of the people were members 
Um, a lot of my teammates were married. I probably had six teammates that were married and had kids. And, you know, I went home and just kind of hung out with my, my roommates and my, my girlfriend, Whitney at the time. And we all had pretty much the same values, you know, there, and, uh, you kind of believed in the same thing. We're all, you know, uh, abiding by the honor code that's at BYU. So we didn't really have a ton of temptation, um, you know, as far as hourly there. And most of the time we were pretty much in, in collection, but then when I got out to, to be uh, to Sacramento is completely different. And, uh, you know, I mean, I can tell you just a quick story real quick. Um, when I first got to, to Sacramento, we went and we played in uh, the summer league in Vegas and uh, our owners at the time were the Maloofs and they were the owners of the Palms hotel. And uh, so we got to the Palms hotel and that's where we stayed. And the first night that we got there, they said, um, we <laughs> you know, as a part of being a Sacramento King on this team, we want you guys to come up to the Playboy Mansion that's up in the very top and be able to promote our alcohol that we have because they just opened a new alcohol. And uh, at that point, I was like, oh man, <laughs> everyone was like super excited. Like on the bus, they were cheering. They were like, yes, this is going to be great. And I'm sitting there like, oh no, what is the, what am I going to do? You know, this is, I just got drafted by these bosses. They're, you know, they, they make or break me. They can trade me. They can cut me, whatever they wanted to do. Um, but I knew at that, I knew that what I needed to do was I needed to go talk to them and say, hey, um, you know, Mr. Maloof, um, I just wanted to let you know, you know, I'm a member of the church. Um, I don't drink alcohol. Uh, I don't really want to be a part of that. Is it okay if I just skip this one? I'll do three other ones for you. You know, three different things. You know, I'll do anything else. Um, but if it's, is it okay if, you know, I don't go to this party and promote this alcohol? And of course they wanted me there because I was their top draft pick. You know, I was the face of the franchise at that point. And, uh, but I had the courage to go talk to them about it and they were okay with it. They were cool with it. They were like, okay, you know what, Jimmer, you'll be okay. That's fine. Uh, we appreciate you asking, letting us know. And, uh, you know, they let me do other things instead of it. So I had many temptations like that. My, 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 my teammates always wanted me to come out and party with them. And that's not just a high school party that they, that they go and do, you know, they're, they're doing some crazy stuff. Um, and they're all over the place. Um, but I just decided that that wasn't what I wanted to do. I knew that, um, you know, the most important thing to me was my gospel, was the gospel, my family, um, having the spirit with me, being a good priesthood holder. Um, those were the most important things to me. And I wouldn't be able to have those things if I went and partied and did all these things. Um, so it, it, in the long run, it's helped me way, way more. But, um, you know, I've, I still have these temptations. Everyone does to this day. Um, but uh, if you stay strong and you know what the answer you are going to have before you get into the situation is, if you know that you're firm, hey, this is not me, this is not who I am, you're going to be able to make that decision a lot easier than if you're on the fence about it. Um, so that's what I always tell people. And uh, that's what I've tried to do. So, I love that. Thank you for that answer. And, and Jim, I, we've had a lot, we're getting a ton of questions coming in. <laughs> Folks, just keep them on. We'll, we'll do yeah. our best. One of the questions I've seen come through several times is as a professional athlete, um, it, it requires you to play on Sundays, which could interfere with your desire to worship and so forth. I remember yeah, when yeah. you were in Sacramento, yeah. your, your dad attended church in my ward, yeah. uh, which was just about a mile from Arco Arena. So yeah. um, how, how have you been able to balance the challenges of a career that pulls you away from the worship and the, the service that I know you'd like to do? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it's not easy, um, you know, and, uh, you know, especially in China, um, you know, when I was there for those three years, um, if I wasn't in Shanghai at, on Sundays during that time where I didn't have practice or I didn't have a game on a Sunday, then I wasn't able to go to church. You know, there's was no other churches across the country that I knew of. I'm sure there was a few others, but that I knew of. I just had my, you know, little branch that was there and I was able to go as much as I possibly could. Um, but other than that, I mean, I wasn't able to go a whole lot and uh, it's very difficult, but that's why for me, being able to rely on the scriptures was such a big thing for me. Um, you know, it didn't matter um, what day it was, but specifically, obviously on Sundays, I tried to, um, you know, take time out of my day to make sure that I read the scriptures a few times that day that I try to listen to something good you know, I tried to listen to some type of talk or I tried to listen to some type of music that was uplifting or try to just think about things that were, you know, think about our Heavenly Father, think about good things. 
um, you know, try to stay as, as positive as I possibly could and try to think about our Heavenly Father and His Son and His sacrifice as much as I possibly could on those days um, because I wasn't able to take the sacrament a lot. And, um, you know, so that's, and it's not easy to do that. You feel it. You feel it when you don't get to have those opportunities. Um, so to try to keep the spirit with me at those times, I just tried to keep, you know, myself, um, you know, in the scriptures as much as I could pray as much as I could. And, uh, you know, it really helped, you know, it's, it's not perfect. Um, you know, obviously I'd rather be, you know, at church and be able to feel those feelings and hear the talks and be able to converse with people and, you know, feel that type of worship. But if you don't have an opportunity to, like I didn't, it's still important to be able to remember him during those days. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how I tried to deal with it as best as I could. I think that's, that's the way to do it because we all have to just try to stay motivated, stay close to God, especially in the hard times. And I, I want to ask you a little bit more about some of the hard times um, because you're, you're a great example of someone who's been at the top of the mountain um, in, in college and in the NBA. I remember the day after you were drafted that they had this huge crowd at the airport to welcome you to uh, Sacramento International. And, uh, and then six months later, you're, you're, really uh, you're buried at the end of the bench and the negativity came in now a lot of people are dealing with some things that they didn't plan on right now right everybody's dealing with a pandemic and and racial uh, unrest and some of the difficulties that are going on in the country what advice would you give to someone out there who's struggling with and it could be the pandemic it could be losing a job it could be sickness how would you encourage them to keep their faith in God and in Jesus Christ, even in really difficult times? Yeah, that's, a, that's awesome. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely the hardest thing that we have to do, you know, on this earth is be able to, to get through tough times and to have faith enough to be able to push forward. Um, as I talked about kind of a little bit, you know, you just have to really, really believe that our Heavenly Father has a plan for each and every single one of us. And, um, you know, he does, he has a plan for each and every single one of us. And if we have that type of faith and that we take things in stride as best as you can, um, you're going to come out on top and you're going to be able to fulfill and reach whatever it is that our heavenly father has planned for you. So for example, for me, um, you know, I was in, you know, I was in the NBA and I thought I was going to be an NBA superstar. You know, I thought I was going to be great and it didn't happen. And, you know, they basically, I got my last season, I got cut by San Antonio and they said, we don't want you anymore. It's the first time I ever got cut by a basketball team in my entire life. And uh, they cut me and they were like, okay, so now what am I going to do? You know, I was a little bit down. I was like, all right, I got to find a new path. Um, and, you know, I decided to go to China and I said to myself, you know what, there's one of two things that I could do here. I can go to China. I can mope. I could whine. I could not, you know, worry about anything. I'd go over there, just collect a paycheck and get home as quickly as I possibly could. Or I could go over there and immerse myself in the culture. I could be kind. I could be good to my teammates. I could be, try to become the best basketball player that I could possibly be and be one of the best basketball players to ever go over in China and play. I could go one of those two roads. And I tried to go the, the road of trying to be the best basketball player, the best person. And because of that, I've reap so many more benefits um, in my life than I would have probably staying in the NBA um, on the court, off the court, um, you know, you know, all the stuff that I've been able to, to do and all the people that I've been able to reach worldwide, all the fans that I have now worldwide, um, you know, because of that, I've been able to have so many great blessings. And it was all because I had the mindset of, Hey, you know, this didn't go the exact way that I wanted to, but that's okay it's time to pick a new route and do the best that I possibly can at that. And you have to try to control the things that you can control. You can't always control how much you play. You can't always control if you get cut from a team or not. You can't always control if you get fired or not. There's, there's a lot of things that you can't control, but what you can control is you can control your attitude. You can control your work ethic and you can control whether you're happy or not. And that's what I tried to focus on, those three things. And if I did those every single day to the best of my ability, I knew that I was going to, to eventually be successful. And I feel like I've become more successful than I ever could have before because I was able to remember those things. I love that advice. Uh, handle the things we can control and make the most of those. 
And uh, a professional athlete certainly learns that probably as, as well as anybody else. <laughs> Uh, you for have sure. to learn that, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, someone asked the question: Did you, uh, did your teammates in the NBA ever about uh, ever get curious about your religious beliefs and uh, treat you differently, both positively or maybe negatively, because of it? Definitely. Um, they all knew that I was from BYU. They all knew I was a member of the church. Um, some of them thought I was extremely weird. Um, some of them thought, you know. Some of them thought like I, I didn't want to be friends with them because I wouldn't go out and drink with them or go out and party with them tonight. Some people took that as almost like a disrespectful thing. Like, mm -hmm. oh man, everybody else is coming out, but you're not going to come out. Why don't you want to be a part of the team? Um, you know, there was, there was a handful of guys that were like that, but then there were a handful of guys that were like, man, I wish I could do what you're doing. Um, I wish that I could, you know, stop drinking cold Turkey and, and just, you know, be able to, you know, not go out and party and it's, it's it, it but I, you know they're sometimes at that point they're addicted they can't really help and i'm like well you could probably do it if you want to you know i'll, I'll teach you how and you can just hang out with me um you know and everything but uh it, it i definitely you know had my fair share of people that that didn't respect me for it but at the same time you know for me it was just important to make sure that i was always authentic that i that i was who i was um, I didn't want to change who I was um, for anybody. And I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, I was always a positive influence. I was trying to come into practice every day as a good person, um, you know, and, and be uplifting and do all that I could um, because, you know, that's, that's what I could do. And, uh, you know, I tried to do that every day. That's great. I, I've got to ask you a question about motivation and who, who has motivated you in your life. I know back at BYU, I'm sure, the coach, Jim Hamblin, you remember, oh, Hamblin, I'm yeah. sure he's a great motivator. He's on watching right now, but uh, um, Jim, my guy, Hambone, he's the man. Hambone, how are you? Don't, <laughs> don't put, I'm, I graduated, so don't put me in any more classes. There you go. He helped me throughout the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, Hambone is, is one in a million. But uh, as you think about motivators, who's who have been great motivators for you in your life? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, my brother was always a great motivator for me. You know, he always tried to uh, make sure that I was trying to reach my potential. Um, he saw it at a young age that I, he thought I could be a really good basketball player. Um, and, uh, you know, he really worked with me every single day to, to become better. And because of that, I saw myself getting better. And then I had an internal uh, motivation that, like, I wanted to do this because, you know, this was my goal. And, uh, but he helped me believe in myself. And then, you know, my dad was the person that, you know, motivated me to be a better person. Um, you know, he was a guy that, you know, he was, he's still a member of this church. He's had every single calling you could possibly have in this church, except for Bishop, because our, my mom isn't a member, but he's had every single calling. He helped grow the church in our area, literally grow it from a cornfield where they used to meet to having a church building and, and doing all these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, which that motivated me to be a good person because he believes in it so much and he knows that it's true. And I saw that every day and I saw people come to him for problems. And uh, so that motivated me to be, to be a good person. And then when I got to college, coach Rose, uh, my college coach just motivated me like crazy. Um, you know, he was on me from day one. Like he, he saw something in me and he did not take it easy on me ever. And uh, my first year at BYU was, was, was a little bit tough. Um, you know, he didn't play me necessarily as much as I wanted to right away. Um, but he always was in my ear. He was always pushing me um, because he knew that I could be really good. And uh, if he would have taken it easy on me and just let me do what I wanted to do right from a young age, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, so he for sure motivated me and helped me get to, to, to where I am. And, and uh, so I'm grateful for him for that. Um, we got the question here. I think it's pretty interesting, you know, Someone wants to know, can you describe the work ethic and dedication it takes to be a professional athlete and maybe how that plays a part in your own spiritual growth in life? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really a different level. It's a different level of work, um, you know, as far as, uh, as a professional athlete goes. Um, there are a lot of amazing athletes out there there really are. And they're basketball players. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of great basketball players out there and um, all over the world. It's a world game now. It's a global game. 
And uh, to be one of the 350, 400 guys that are in the NBA, um, you have to have a different mindset. And uh, that's what I always had. I felt like for me, it didn't necessarily start with my skill set. It started with my mental capacity. Um, you know, I truly, like I said, I did not have a plan B. I truly believed that I was going to make the NBA. And I made my goals every single day, all, you know, every single year to see myself moving in a direction to get to where I wanted to be. It's being in the NBA. Um, you know, so I would put it up, I'd, I'd write my goals down and I'd look at them every single day and I'd say, all right, this is what I need to do. If I can accomplish this, I'm one step closer to making it to the NBA. Um, and you know, I would work for it every single day, um, you know, relentlessly. Um, I'd go out and shoot, I'd go out and play, I'd go out and, and uh, I'd condition, I'd lift, I'd run, um, I'd do all these things. Um, and I, I, I heard a, a speaker the other day on a podcast talk about, he, he's not even, a, he's not an athlete at all. He's, a, he's CEO of a company. And he said the greatest people at their, um, at their profession, what they do is when times get tough and when you feel like you don't want to do something, you push harder that day. You push harder than you think that you possibly could. And the great ones do it. The great ones are like, all right, I don't feel good today. Um, you know, I, bet I just need to take a day off. You know, I just need to, to, to go out and, and just have a real light day. Most of the people in this world, that's what they're going to do. But the great ones, they say, no, no, no. I feel this. I feel that I'm not doing well. I feel that, I'm, that I have low energy today. It's time to ramp this up because I know if I do that, that most of the people aren't doing that. And uh, so that's, that's the type of mentality you have, um, at, for me at least, as a professional athlete. Um, you know, every single day, like this, this is a pandemic has been a perfect um, example. Um, you know, for the last five months, you know, I've been home in Denver and, uh, I've been just working out. I, I have a, I have a key to the gym at the stake center. And, uh, my, my state president told me that I can get into the gym if I go in by myself and uh, wipe it down afterwards. So I go to the gym by myself. I've been going for five months by myself every day, just me and a ball playing basketball, trying to get better. And that's really, really difficult to do by yourself for five months without anybody else in the gym and to really feel like you're getting better as an athlete. Um, so yeah, those are the type of things that the, the best players and the best professions, the best professionals and whatever they, they're doing, that's what they do. They push hard. Um, they have the same consistent work ethic every single day trying to get better. And because of that, I feel like mentally I've been able to be, be good spiritually because of the fact that, you know, I have, I have a strong mental capacity to do what I believe in. And, um, you know, so, and I believe in the, I believe in the gospel. I believe in this church. Uh, I believe in, in doing good things and doing good works. And because of that, I have that mentality. I want to try, try to go out and physically do something good for someone every day. And uh, whether it's something really, really simple or something more grand. And if you have that in your head, and you go out there and you really act upon it, it really helps you spiritually as well. And that's kind of moved from the athletic world to the spiritual world. So it's, um, it's fun how it's been able to do that. That's awesome. That's really great. Um, I, you've been super generous with your time, Jimmer. Do you have time for two more questions? Sure, of course. Right. Um, the first thing though, if you're tired of shooting alone, come on out here to Utah County. I've got a key to the gym. We yeah. Can, we can shoot together. I know. I love it. You can, you can be my rebounder. There you go. I'll rebound for you. You, know, you don't want to rebound for me. That's all you can do. That's good, to, good conditioning. There you go. That's right. So this, this question is, you know, in our, in our country right now, we're dealing with a lot of um, racial unrest and uncertainty and communication is struggling. And some of my friends, my African-American friends have told me over the years that it's, it's hard because they, they feel like they're black people living in a white world. Your perspective, I think, could could really help us because in the NBA, you were a white man in a black world, especially in the locker room. What lessons did you learn from that experience? And as you continue to learn that you think you could share with the rest of us that we could maybe all learn from and do better with? I think for, for me, I, I talk about this with my family a lot, you know, with my wife, obviously. Uh, we all watch the news and see what's going on. And, um, I think I always think it's really unfortunate, obviously, um, you know, for me, I've been in, I've been with all different races um, all over the world. You're you know, all over Europe, been all over Asia. I've been all over the United States, um, you know, dealt with every single race. 
And uh, for me, what I find is that everyone is, mostly everyone is trying to always reach a common goal. And everyone is all, mostly trying to be good people. And at heart, you have to believe that these, most of everyone is trying to do good things. Um, we all have different backgrounds. We all have different, uh, you know, political beliefs. We all have different, um, you know, uh, adversities that we go through. We all have different things. But if we can come together and just talk to one another and get to know our neighbor, literally, just be able to, as the, as the commandments say, love thy neighbor. And if we can just get to know the people that are next to us, it doesn't matter which race they are. If you get to know them, then you're going to become familiar with that person. You're going to become familiar with their background. You're going to see where they're coming from. And you're going to be able to have a greater perspective of what's going on. And then you're going to be able to make a change together. And uh, I think that's the, the biggest thing that we're going through. A lot of times we're seeing, you know, what's going on in the world, but we don't know the actual person. You know, we don't know the people that are going through this um, in any different race. So if we can reach out to them and talk to them and get all sides of the story, I think that's how you really become or you are really able to serve one another and to be able to love thy neighbor and be able to come together um, and become united. Um, so that's that's always been my advice. And I, I always say you got to control what you, control yourself, do good things be a good person, help everyone around you and be inclusive, no matter who they are, include everyone, be able to, to make uh, an effort to be able to, to go and, and talk to someone that may be very different than you are, to get to know them, to, to see who they are and see where they're coming from, because then you'll be able to reach some common ground and you'll be able to love that person. Um, so I think it's really important in today's day and age to do that. And uh, it's something that I try to do and and my family talks about and we try to do on, a, on um, you know, as much as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I knew you'd have insight that would be helpful. All right. Last question is the one I've probably gotten the most of tonight. And that is, what is going on with you? What, uh, what's next for Jimmer Fredette? Yeah, great question. Um, so more than likely, I haven't signed an official deal yet, but more than likely I'll be going back to China. Um, you know, and uh, to the same team that I played for before in Shanghai. It looks like they want me back, which is awesome. Um, I'm excited about it. Um, you know, those are there. I had some of my best years there and, uh, you know, professionally and off the court. And, um, you know, like I said, I haven't signed officially yet, but hopefully it will be very, very soon. And um, from there, um, hopefully to get back out to Shanghai and be able to see the people again and be able to hopefully make an impact both on and off the court. So uh, we'll see exactly you know, how it goes, but, um, you know, I'm excited for that opportunity and, and, uh, you know, hoping we can get over there safely and be able to have a great season. Awesome. Well, we've, we've loved listening to you tonight. We've loved following your career. All of us, I'm sure most of those who are on, uh, on this live stream tonight, uh, I know we've all benefited from, from your, your experiences, your stories and your wisdom that you've shared with us. And, uh, and most of all, we've benefited from your faith and your willingness to share your testimony with us tonight. So, Jimmer, from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of all of the missionaries in the Utah Orem Mission, at least, I know we, we're just thrilled and grateful that you were there. Uh, you were willing to come on with us tonight. Uh, I also want to thank everyone else who, um, who participated, who made this happen, for those behind the scenes who were responding to questions and helping people who were on. We had over 1,200 people, I think was, was the highest mark that I saw. So a lot of people following us tonight. We, uh, we hope that you enjoyed this uh, presentation on the road to hope and peace. And we hope if this was your first time to our site that you'll like our page, you'll follow our page and, uh, and you'll share our content with your friends and your neighbors and those who would benefit from our message of hope and peace and faith in these difficult times. So Jimmer, we uh, again, thank you one last time. You're a great man and we wish you all the best. If there's anything we can do for you here, um, we'll let us know. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it, um, you know, Brother Treadway and thank you for everyone for listening. And um, you know, maybe I'll be out there in Utah soon, but thanks a lot. We'll talk to you guys soon. All right, thanks a lot. Have a great night. Thanks, you too. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.